Hi everybody, it is time for another story time from Japanese history. In this session, we're going to talk about one of the most famous incidents from Japanese history. You definitely heard of it. It's the 47 Ronin. Now, this story has been remade, retold countless times. It's film, books, manga plays. It's been everywhere. Some of the stories are, uh, some of these retellings are more accurate than others. <laughs> some just have the number 47 in the title and that's it. But uh, let's talk a little bit about our best understanding of how it went down historically. So as our scene opens, it's April 1701. There's a relatively young daimyo in town. This is Asano Naganori and he is a rural daimyo. Uh, he's, he's been assigned to welcome the imperial envoys to the shogunate court. Remember, at this time, the shogunate's running the, t running the show and the emperor is largely a figurehead. But the imperial envoys is still very important. So he is assigned to learn the proper etiquette for this situation, along with another daimyo. And so the two of them are assigned to an etiquette master, Kira Yoshinaka. Now, for being an etiquette master, it sounds like Kira was kind of a jerk, actually. Uh, there's a lot of dispute on, it's open for debate on what exactly went on, but here's something that, uh, that at least to me reads is fairly plausible. It was traditional at the time to give your instructor a gift, and Asano's gift did not impress Kira. Whether it was just an improper gift, because he was a uh, kind of a rural daimyo and didn't know better, or whether it was that Kira wanted a gift, <laughs> All right, and uh, something, you know, basically a corruption, kind of a bribe scenario. Um, that That's, we don't know. But what we do know is that uh, Kira made Asano and the other daimyo's life fairly miserable, and the other daimyo was very insulted, wanted to respond to it. Asano kept counseling uh, patients, and uh, the courtiers, the retainers of the other daimyo, uh, actually kind of saved his hide by making a huge gift to Kira on his behalf, which bought Kira's patience. But that made Asano look even worse by comparison. And so Kira just really rode on Asano and just really made his life miserable. And uh, Asano bore it and bore it and bore it until one day in the uh, Matsu Oroka, which is a long corridor with, uh, painted with pines, Matsu. And um, Kira said something don't actually know what, but probably translated roughly to you uneducated redneck hick. And Asano just snapped and he pulled his dagger, jumped and gave Akira a minor stabbing in the head. And it was a minor stabbing. You know, there was just a, just a, just a head wound. <laughs> he, he recovered, he was fine. Uh, but the Shogun Tokugawa said, uh, no, I don't, I don't care what went down. You can't be pulling blades in my palace. This is, this is not how we do things here. Uh, that's, absolutely forbidden. So I'm going to let you have the honor of killing yourself, you know, committing an honorable, honorable suicide, but your family forfeits the title and lands, so no longer daimyo. So Asano commits a fuku there in the garden and uh, word goes back to Ako back home. Now, when word reaches Ako, there's a lot of dispute. Uh, these, This is a problem <laughs> for all of the retainers. Uh, if as now being masterless, being ronin, they are dishonored. They cannot be employed by other daimyo. They cannot fight as samurai. Uh, they're, you know, just persona non grata. And so there's a lot of dispute, you know, what do we do? Do we give up the castle as order? Do we fight to defend it? Do we just kill ourselves at the gate? But the man in charge, Oishi Kuranosuke Yoshio, counsels a different path. He says, hold on, let's play a long game. Everybody surrender. So they surrender, they give up their honor, they give up their positions, they go out into the community, into the world, and live as dishonored ronin. So now they're doing manual labor, they're doing handicrafts. Oishi goes into a life of retirement and just absolutely, just this horrible, dissolute, dishonored life. He's getting drunk all the time, he's visiting prostitutes. At one point he collapses in the street. The story goes that he's lying in the street passed out drunk and another samurai comes by and just begins to castigate him on his lack of honor and how far he has fallen and it's disreputable and actually kicks him in the face uh, as he lies there in the street. So just absolute, and, he, and, and he's, there are spies. Kira is watching because Kira is like, oh, these guys are going to come after me. But the spies are reporting back, these, these, these guys, no, they're, 
they're horrible, <laughs> they're the worst samurai you've ever seen, they're not going to be a threat. So Oishi is playing this part so well. His wife, he's been married for about 20 years, his wife comes to him and says, hey, I think you're taking this a little bit far. I mean, you're you're drunk in the street, you're hanging out with the prostitutes, can, can you just tone this down a little? And he says, oh, honey, you're right. I'm going to divorce you. Now, to be fair to Oishi, he probably divorced her and sent her and the children away so that they could not be, have any repercussions for what he was going to do. It was to keep them safe, but uh, it just made him look even that much worse that he would divorce his wife of 20 years and send her and the children away. Now, his oldest son, Chikata, uh, he put down a sword and a toy and he asked, no, I'm sorry, that's Lone Wolf and Cub. No, his oldest son, Chikara, was 15 at the time and he said, do you want to join me in this or do you want to go? And Chikara said, no, I'm absolutely in with you. Let's do this. So Chikara stayed with him and uh, they practiced and they trained and they snuck weapons in, which would have been completely illegal. They made their own armor so they wouldn't arouse any suspicion by purchasing armor. These guys, long game, hardcore. And it was a long game. Remember, we started in April of 1701. It was January of 1703 when Oishi decided, yeah, it's been long enough. Spies have told Kira we're complete trash. Nobody's suspicious. Let's do this. So on January 30th, of 1703, the 47 Ronin went to Kira's home and they sent one aside as a messenger. So only 46 actually attacked the house. But here's why I think the stories about Kira being a jerk probably have some truth to them, probably plausible. Before they attacked Kira's home, they went to the neighbors and they're like, hey, by the way, we're gonna attack this house, but it's not a robbery. We're here for a revenge mission. And the neighbor's like, oh, that's fine then. We didn't like that guy anyway. Right. So this entire time, you know, there's this actual battle going on and they attack from the front and the rear in two groups, one led by Oishi, one led by a And uh, and none of the neighbors help. None of the neighbors send for help. They'll just kind of like sit back and make popcorn and watch. So Kira wasn't a popular figure. Uh, so they, they, they break in. Like I said, they attack from two sides. Um, the, the, the Ronin just absolutely, they catch the household completely off guard. The, uh, they kill up to 40 of Kida's retainers. The 47 themselves, by the end of the night, they'd have four walking wounded. That's it. Four injured who are still, still able to travel. And uh, they killed, like I said, up to 40 retainers. They were on a mission. Um, but they can't find Kida anywhere. And they spend an hour looking through the house. Now they have said previously, you know, we're, we're not here for the innocent people. So women, children, servants, you know, like, as long as everybody stays out of the way, we're fine. We're not, we're not taking revenge on anyone except Kira. They spend an hour searching through the house. They finally find a guy hiding in a storage shed, uh, half dressed and just there in his, uh, his, his gives and they, they drag him out. And by all the accounts we have, which again, are the, the Ronin's own, own story, uh, but he refuses to identify himself and he, he just sits on the ground and shakes. And so I'm really sure this is, great Kira, really. Um, but they recognize him by the scar because remember there was a head wound. They recognize him by the scar. And uh, so Oishi actually kneels in front of him, gives him the same wakazashi that Asano used to kill himself and say, here's your chance to make it right. And Kira refuses, doesn't take it, uh, is alleged to be a total coward and just shake <laughs> at the time. And Oishi says, fine, I'll do it myself. And he does. So at that point, they put Kira's head in a bucket and it's morning at this point. And they start, you know, it's a progression from Kira's house to the temple where Asano is buried. It's about, I think roughly 10 kilometer walk. So they're traveling through town. By this point, word has spread because the neighbors were making popcorn, right? The word has spread and people are coming out, praising them, offering them food and drink as they travel through the town. As I said, I'm thinking Kira wasn't a really popular guy. <laughs> so they're all the way through, they're like, oh man, you did the right thing. You stood by your Lord. You defended his memory, all of this. So they travel through town. They get to the temple, Sendakuji temple, and uh, they wash the head of Kira in a well there at the temple. They place the head at Asano's grave, like, look, we fixed it, here it is. And then they all turn themselves in. Now, as I said, they were pretty popular already on the morning uh, of this event. 
And when they turned themselves in, they were arrested, but they were housed during their arrest by four major daimyo families as guests. They were heroes. And the shogun was, oh my gosh, like, like they kind of, they kind of did a thing. <laughs> like this, this was, they, they really actually came back and defended their Lord's honor. This is, this is something we should appreciate. And the shogun's counselor was like, yeah, but you really can't like encourage this murder thing. Like you, you kind of, and they're like, okay, you're right. So ultimately uh, the decision was to order the Ronin to commit seppuku for their, for their crimes. So it's an honorable death, it's still a death and still an execution, but it's an honorable one. But the family of Asano, Asano's older son, is permitted to have back the title and a tenth of the lands. So there's a little bit of reparations made in recognition of the Ronin's behavior. Now there's some question about what motivated the Ronin to do this, because actually in the Bushido Code, you could avenge family. You, there wasn't anything quite like this that they had done. It wasn't really a part of the code, but, uh, but it was something that you know, people really seized on. It also was a way for the 47 of them to sacrifice themselves uh, to buy back opportunity and a place in society for the entire rest of the Asano clan and retainers. So um, they actually, they, they gave up their well-being for the sake of everyone else having a place again. Now, if you go to Sengakuji today, you'll see their graves very much respected, very much honored even today. If you look at these photos that I took, you see those wooden markers? Those are signs of memorial services. They're constantly replaced um, with, with new services. So these people are definitely receiving uh, memorial services consistently today. You'll also see incense burning at the graves. Uh, I burned some. Uh, you'll see flowers at the graves. You see uh, little boxes or bottles of sake where people are bringing them liquor. Uh, so all kinds of, uh, excuse me, all kinds of respect and honor are given to these even today. And I purchased my Goshuin Cho uh, at Sengakuji to start my, my uh, this is, uh, if you're not familiar with Goshuin, there, um, it's a book to collect seals from uh, temples and shrines uh, as you go. So if you, so you can uh, collect uh, the, the, the seals in the, um, from the various temples and visits. And because I bought mine at Sengakuji, it has the 47 Ronin uh, on the on the cover. So so that is the tale of the 47 Ronin. And like I said, you'll see it referenced, you'll see it retold, but that is to our best knowledge how it happened. Thank you for joining me for another story time from Japanese history. I'll see you in another session.